Good day, everybody. My name is Zhu Li, and today we're doing a presentation on primary and secondary open angle glaucoma. The AAO definition of primary open angle glaucoma is that of a chronic, slow progressive optic neuropathy in which there is characteristic atrophy of the optic nerve with attendant visual field loss. The anterior chamber angle is open and appears normal. There is often an increased intraocular pressure, usually more than 21 mm of mercury, without ocular or systemic abnormalities that may account for the increased intraocular pressure. And, typically, optic nerve head damage or glaucomatous visual field damage is present. The exact prevalence rates vary depending on the criteria used for diagnosis. In Singapore, the prevalence of glaucoma is 3.2% in the Chinese population, 3.4% in the Malay population, and 1.95% in the Indian population, with attendant prevalence of primary open angle glaucoma being 1.7, 2.5, and 1.17% respectively. Elevation of the intraocular pressure usually results from decreased facility of aqueous fluid outflow and is thought to be due to resistance within the trabecular meshwork. Multiple theories have been postulated about the cause of increased flow resistance and include loss of trabecular endothelial cells, increased pigment accumulation within these endothelial cells, thickening or fusion of the trabecular lamellae, thickening of the scleral spur, increased extracellular plaque material in the anterior chamber angle, and loss of ability of the endothelial cells lining Schlem's canal to form giant vacuoles. Secondary open angle glaucoma has an identifiable cause such as mechanical blockage of aqueous outflow through the trabecular meshwork, leading to elevated intraocular pressure. Examples of conditions in which this occur include pseudoexfoliation syndrome, pigment dispersion syndrome, hyphema, hemolytic and ghost cell glaucoma, Schwarzmatzow syndrome, and lens-related scenarios such as phacolytic and phacoantigenic glaucoma. Alterations in the structure and function of the trabecular meshwork also lead to open-angle glaucoma. For example, Angle recession glaucoma post trauma, ischemia, and in inflammatory conditions such as hypertensive uveitis, Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis, and steroid induced glaucoma. Furthermore, open angle glaucoma can develop in cases of elevated episcleral venous pressure, such as in the case of arteriovenous malformations, uh, for example, carotidocavernous sinus fistula, orbital varics and Sturge Weber, venous obstructive scenarios such as thyroid eye disease or if a patient has a retrobulbar tumor and in superior vena cava syndrome. The etiology of open-angle glaucoma is widely accepted as being a combination of two main factors. Firstly, the mechanical compression of the axons due to elevated intraocular pressure, and secondly, the vascular component of ocular circulation disturbances, which leads to hypoperfusion, ischemia, and hypoxia. Both factors compromise the ganglion cell axons at the level of the lamina cribrosa, leading to apoptosis or genetically programmed death. Risk factors can be divided into general, ocular, and non-ocular. General risks include advanced age, race, and a positive family history of glaucoma. Ocular risks are numerous and include an elevated intraocular pressure, thin central corneal thickness, asymmetry, of more than 0.2 between cup disc ratios of both eyes, myopia, and retinal vascular occlusions. Finally, non-ocular risks include low perfusion pressure, diabetes, which is controversial, and vasospastic disorders. In open-angle glaucoma, clinical features to note include a raised ocular, intraocular pressure, usually more than 21 mm of mercury, External and anterior segment signs, as well as gonioscopy findings, which I'll go into further detail in subsequent slides, and the optic disc appearance, which can be divided into generalized and focal signs. With regards to optic disc cupping, features include a vertical cup disc ratio of more than 0.7, asymmetry of the cup disc ratios in both eyes of 0.2 and above, as mentioned before, and that the ISNT rule is not being obeyed. Focal signs that one should look for include rim notching, disc pallor, disc hemorrhages, peripapillary atrophy, and nasalization of the vessels. In primary open angle glaucoma, as previously stated, one will expect a normal anterior segment and a gonioscopic examination with open angles. 
Features of pseudoexfoliation syndrome include dandruff-like material at the pupillary margin and a hoarfrost ring, which is more obvious in dilation. Pupils are often poorly dilating and there are peripupillary translumination iris defects. Sonules are often weak with associated phacodonesis and lens subluxation. On gonioscopy, pseudoexfoliative material and some Paulesi's lines can sometimes be seen. In pigmentary dispersion syndrome, signs to look for include Krukenberg spindle and pigment deposition on the lens. Posterior iris bowing and peripheral iris atrophy can also be seen, as well as heavy pigmentation of the entire angle in a queer iris configuration on gonioscopy. As the name suggests, neovascular glaucoma will have iris and angle neovascularization and often present with a cloudy cornea and spontaneous hyphema. After trauma, look out for angle recession glaucoma. Signs include a very deep anterior chamber, a symmetry of the anterior chamber depth between both eyes, and angle recession with possible iridodialysis on gonioscopy. Patients with phacolytic glaucoma will present with an intumescent cataract and cortical material within the anterior chamber. Otherwise known as posner schlossmann syndrome, hypertensive uveitis patients have mild anterior chamber activity and a few scattered stellate keratic precipitates. They may also have peripheral anterior synechi, secondary to the uveitis, which can be seen on gonioscopy. The raised episcleral venous pressure in carotid cavernous sinus fistula leads to blood in the Schlem's canal observable on gonioscopy. More obvious features of congestion include proptosis, engorged episcleral corkscrew vessels, and pulsatile myers on the golden applination tonometry. Glaucoma is commonly associated with phacomatoses. This includes sturge weber syndrome, with patients having a facial port wine stain, episcleral hemangioma, and choroidal hemangioma. The diagnosis of the patient can be made with a raised intraocular pressure, though intraocular pressure may appear normal on examination due to fluctuation or diurnal variation. Structural changes occurring at the optic nerve head and retinal nerve fiber layer. Functional changes. And of course, initial evaluation would require that you take a history with risk factors as discussed previously and do a thorough examination checking the visual acuity, pupils by microscopy, tonometry, gonioscopy, and of course, direct visualization and evaluation of the optic nerve head, nerve, uh, nerve fiber layer, and peripapillary area. Investigations that can be performed include pachymetry, stereo disc photography, perimetry, such as a visual field or FDT, optical coherence tomography of the retinal nerve fiber layer. Primary open angle glaucoma is often bilateral, but can be quite asymmetric. Central visual acuity is relatively unaffected till late in the disease, so visual field loss may be significant before symptoms are noted. There's great variability in the susceptibility of the optic nerve to glaucomatous damage. Some people with relatively low intraocular pressure, such as in normotensive glaucoma, can incur significant optic nerve damage, while others with rather high intraocular pressures, such as in ocular hypertension, never show such damage. This is reflective of the non-Gaussian distribution of intraocular pressure, which skews towards the higher end in older populations. It is not all dire, as most patients do retain useful vision their entire lives if treated appropriately, and the incidence of blindness variously reported at about 9 to 27% 20 years after diagnosis. Here are the clinical stages of primary open angle glaucoma as described by Quigley and colleagues. And only briefly touching on the management principles, the main goal is to prevent significant visual impairment within the patient's lifetime by controlling the intraocular pressure in the target range, stabilizing the optic nerve and retinal nerve fiber layer status, and the visual fields. Treatment, which will be discussed in another lecture, can be stratified into medical, laser, and surgical treatment. So shown below are a few pivotal glaucoma studies that one must be familiar with and are summarized below for your own perusal.
In summary, open-angle glaucoma is a complex disease and one of the leading causes of blindness. Intraocular pressure is the most easily identifiable and modifiable of uh, risk factors, and a comprehensive eye examination is essential for the earliest possible diagnosis of open-angle glaucoma. Periodic evaluation of the glaucoma suspect is required to detect subtle changes, both structurally and functionally, that may precede the overt clinical signs of the disease. It cannot be prevented and is irreversible, but adequate treatment can reduce the rate and extent of additional damage. The effect effectiveness of the treatment of primary open-angle glaucoma depends on the specific modality and varies significantly between studies. Uh, below are the references. And thank you for your attention.